Good morning, Iman. How are you? Good. How are you? <laughs> Iman. I'm fantastic. I'm fantastic. It's so good to see your beautiful face this morning. I know it's afternoon for you or evening in California? Afternoon. It's about three o'clock. Okay. And it's breakfast time for me in Australia. Yes. So welcome to the Endurance Town USA podcast. This is part of a mini series called Endurance is a State of Mind. And you are one of the beautiful humans I thought of when I was putting this mini series together because this is so your jam. And anytime I've talked to you and connected with you, it's just what I see, um, you know, coming out of your, your being over there. So I can't wait to dig in with you. First, I want to have our audience understand a little bit about who you are. And so if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about yourself. So for example, where did you grow up and what did your childhood look like? Mm -hmm. um, so my name's Iman Wilkerson. I, I grew up um, born and raised in North Carolina. Um, I grew up in a small town that, um, you know, we had a house on uh, 13 acres of land. So lots of, um, lots of land to roam around, to be free, to run. And our neighbors, my, my best friend lived next door, but next door wasn't next door in the suburban sense. It's, you know, you had to walk a little bit down the, the driveway to get in as a gravel driveway. Um, so a lot of my upbringing was just really about being outside and in nature. Uh, my father was a pilot and he was also an avid uh, fly fisherman. Oh, cool. I think that when he took us on these fly fishing trips, like I just didn't really, or just like these, these trips out in the woods and the mountains where he would try to get us to fish. I didn't take it, I took it for granted. I didn't really enjoy the aspect of being in nature because I was always in nature. Um, but when I look back on it, like those opportunities and those moments are really, really beautiful. Um, my mother, she's a teacher and she's an artist and she uh, was really big into fashion. So my influence came from, um, from her a lot, especially since my father was a commercial pilot. So um, he spent a lot of time um, in the air flying. So my mother really influenced me and my younger brother um, so I eventually went to school to uh, the Fashion Institute of Technology to study international trade and marketing in the fashion industry. Oh, cool. And I uh, lived in New York City for 12 years. And um, I had, it, when I was in my early 20s, I had an image consulting firm. Um, and eventually I uh, worked as a production product developer uh, for American Eagle. And, um, and then I moved to Chicago. Um, in Chicago, I was only there for two winters. That's as long as I could <laughs> endure. That was your max capacity. Got to go. That was my max. <laughs> um, and uh, then I made my way um, out west to San Diego. So I live in San Diego now, and I've been here for about five years. Wow. So North Carolina upbringing, a little bit in the farm, in the country, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, did you play sports? I did. So I played basketball. Um, I was a little bit of a tomboy. Um, and so I played basketball uh, with the neighborhood boys and, and played JV. I eventually played track or I ran track, um, the 400, four by two every once in a while and the four by four, those are my events. It's funny because endurance is uh, the theme, the name of this game. And uh, I did not want to run anything longer than 800 meters, honestly. <laughs> it, it, to run the mile was like asking me to run a marathon. It was just, uh, the, I had probably ran, ran it at like 20 minutes. Um, I mean, like I was just really not trying at that um, in high school when you were taking PE or something like that. Uh, but it's funny, eventually like in college, the first college I went to before I transferred to FIT, um, I just ran to stay in shape. And I had a boyfriend who encouraged me to go out for a three mile run in the morning. I hated it. I did it. <laughs> I hated it. Uh -huh. And what has been a theme in my life is there's this inkling, this feeling in me that's like, all right, this first time was not going to be the best time, but try it again. Try it on your own terms, on your own pace. Mm. So I went back out there on a time that I could probably endure. And then um, <laughs> over time, it was something that I, I 
was proud of myself for achieve, like getting over that hump, that challenge. So mm -hmm. that was a good introduction for me to get into like longer distances. I love how, it, well, you were even willing to do it, right? You didn't tell him to bugger off. And then you did it. I'm sure, I don't know how many times, but you know, discovered that it didn't work for you the way that was structured, but it doesn't mean on your own terms, you couldn't do it differently mm -hmm. and experience it differently. You know, so many times we don't do that, right? Mm -hmm. We fall into other people's expectations and we maybe have an experience that isn't great and then we walk away. Mm -hmm. So yes. that's so good. There are so many lessons to be learned and this is what I, I have to explain to people when they tell me that they're not good at running. I mm -hmm. think inherently we are, we are meant to run. I think this is how we survived over time because we are not the fastest, we're not the strongest creatures, um, but we've endured over time through running, through long distance running. Um, and you just have to know that you're, your first attempt at anything is never going to be your best, um, unless you're a savant, but <laughs> it, your, your body is just adapting, you know, and we are very resilient creatures. So our approach to something may be on defense and we're tense. Um, and I think if you go into that with that state of mind, you have to allow grace. Uh, so then your second or third try is definitely going to be better because your body isn't in de uh, defense mode and thinking that, you know, we have to, um, you know, we're, we have to sustain and not die or, or be under threat of some kind of injury or harm. Um, but knowing that we've accomplished something like that before, we are capable of doing it again and it will be better. Yeah, yeah. And that childhood running experience is so common for most people, right? It was in PE mm -hmm. that they went into structured running and that was always sort of either a punishment, unfortunately, or it was a timed event to reflect your value in terms of, did you pass the fitness test? How right. do you stack up and all of those things? Again, negative reinforcement, negative reinforcement, negative reinforcement. And so a lot of people that I have coached and work with, and I'm sure you're having the same experience, um, carry that super old story and baggage forward you know, I hate running, running sucks mm -hmm. and all the things. And mm -hmm. um, to work through that, you know, like you said, humans evolved running. We mm -hmm. have survived and thrived because we can endure, we have endurance. And so it is in a natural, you know, state of humanity that we should be able to run yeah. and um, ideally just exploring it for ourselves. So college, you went from uh, running for fitness, stay in shape. Were you doing any races of any sort or com competitive? Oh gosh, no. no. It, um, so the first college I went to is called St. Augustine's College, like a very small private uh, uh, college that um, allowed, it made me realize what uh, actual competition looked like. Mm. So, um, so the students that I went to school with were in the Olympics when I got there. Um, they were in Sydney and they were competing. Um, so I was like, I'm not trying to compete on any level with anybody <laughs> here. Um, and so that moment when I ran um, three uh, minutes, or I'm sorry, those, that first three miles, I didn't even know that was a 5K. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I didn't really do anything with that for many years, actually, um, until one day I was invited to run a cross country 5K in New York City when I moved there. Mm -hmm. um, I was at a networking event where somebody was uh, telling me about um, just a, during the week, a run, a very small run that you probably paid $5 to get into um, and asked if I wanted to just jump in. I was like, all right, sure. And it was the same experience. It was very hard. I did not like it. Um, <laughs> I it, it was challenging. It was a course that Prefontaine had run before. And, um, I just remember put, like just shuffling in and I was like, you know what, this was fun. I think I could do better, but that was the last one of that season. So immediately I, uh, went on to meetup.com to look for a run club nearby so that I could be better prepared for the next season, which then the next summer, it was just a summer series. Mm -hmm. Um, and then that's where it all began for me right after that. Yes. And New York city. So how old are you at this point? I was about 26 or 27 at the time. Okay. Um, and 
that's where everything changed. That's where I understood community. Um, that's where I understood what like to aspire, you know, to surround yourself with aspirational people. I would, we would meet at the Upper West Side uh, near Central Park. We'd run along the, the reservoir um, and that loop was, a, was like a 5K, like a, maybe a perfect 5K. And I remember when, so I never really refer to anything as a, like a 5K unless I'm actually racing it. But I, I do remember like on Tuesdays or Thursdays, I'd come back to my boyfriend and be like, I ran a 5K today. Like, <laughs> you know, and I think every, everyone should accomplish, should feel very um, happy for whatever distance that they've accomplished, you know? Yeah. Um, but to me, that was like, that was, that was like something to do in the middle of a week. It was like a 5K. Um, so we would run along the reservoir and I, you know, we'd be in conversations with these people and we would do strangers and they would ask like, oh, so where, what are you up to this weekend? Oh, I'm going to Philly to run this marathon. This marathon, you know, I'm like, you're running the Olympics. Like to me, running a marathon was like running in the Olympics. Like why else would you run this unless you were a professional? Mm -hmm. And then somebody would be like, oh, chain running. I'm like, yeah, I ran that, that marathon before. I'm running New York. And so I'm just surrounded by conversations of marathons and half marathons and just all these these distances that I, I just want to run. I just want to meet, run, drink beer, go. Um, <laughs> so to be surrounded by people who were doing these distances, it was just incredibly aspirational. And it put the seed in my mind that if, and this is not a great correlation at all, but I think this is how people see themselves. Um, if I can run five, a 5K with you at this pace, surely, I can run longer distances like you. So um, that's where I started. It's just like you see yourself through other people. Um, and, and then I made, so I ran a half marathon um, in Central Park, but I made the decision, I think it was, it was 2008. I made the decision that in 2010, I was gonna run the New York City Marathon. And I remember Ooh. my boyfriend at the time was like, well, why don't you just run a marathon like, later this year or next year. And I said, no, like, this is not something you want to jump into. You know, I just, I already knew it. it's like respect the distance, right? Yes. Like you can't, you shouldn't just like go into it and like, well, I want to know what a 10K feels like. I want to race a 10K. I want to know what a half marathon feels like. Do I even like that? You know? Mm -hmm. So New York city, uh, the NYRR has many different ways to, uh, enter and qualify for the marathon. And because it's so popular, you can, um, uh, do charity. Um, you can, uh, raffle, you know, put your name in a raffle. Um, but if you're a New York resident, another way is to run nine of their races and volunteer for one. So I thought that would be a really great way for me Perfect. to be within the community and the environment to see what that is like, especially the buildup. Mm -hmm. So th that's what I did. So in 2008, I made that decision. 2009, I did the nine plus one. I got the, you're qualified to um, submit and pay. You know, you still have to go through the process sure. of paper, all that stuff. But mm -hmm. I remember, and it was like $100 at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just Whoa. so funny, even for the New York City Marathon. But I was like, wow. I was thinking how much that was. That was like such a, that was so much money. Yeah. Uh, I wish it was like that today. <laughs> uh, but I just remember pressing send and I'm just like, oh my goodness, what did I just do? <laughs> I am running a marathon. But it wasn't going to be for like another like 11 months or something. But I was like, this is happening. And it was like, the best experience ever. It was just, I ran, I eventually ran, ended up running seven marathons in four years. Wow. Well, so a couple of things, what I love about that story and the buildup to running your first marathon was how you super aware, conscientiously self-invested in the process to make that a reality, right? It was very intentional. And in that journey of committing and self-investing to get to the start line, you also were very aware of the fact that I need to surround myself with people who are doing this thing that I'm mm -hmm. curious about, that I'm interested in, that I want to pursue for myself. And I, everything is like that in the world. Running is very powerfully like that, how people come together and unite over this one shared passion. Mm -hmm. And you do see yourself through them and through those relationships and through their experiences and through your shared experiences 
in community. So mm -hmm. you've always been a community seeker. I know you're a community builder now, but you've always been a community seeker and understanding how critical that is to your own success. I do, because I know what it's like to be without it. Um, ah. And I think it's, it's incredibly lonely to be without it. And mm -hmm. I often look back as to, you know, like who I am, how I grew up, um, you know, because I lived in a very remote area and there's a reason why I was drawn to a, like going from Pleasant Garden, North Carolina to New York City, they're quite, they're such contrasts. And the reason why I'm drawn to New York City and places like Chicago is because it is a kind of, it's a ecosystem, it's a city, it's very uh, diverse and um, densely populated. So yeah. you feed off of each other, even if you don't know people, you just you feed off of that energy. And it's a little bit hard to do that in rural areas. Um, so to know what it's one, to know what it's like to not live so close to people and you have to really try hard to build community like in Pleasant Garden. Uh, but then also to be in North in New York where even though you are around a lot of people, it's very easy to feel lonely and to feel alone. Um, and everyone is uh, very much about their own way of moving. And, you know, I never knew my neighbors when I was living in the city, um, unless wow. there was there was a blackout. And it wasn't until we all wow. had to get out of our apartments and we just sitting on a sidewalk and like giving each other, sharing each other, sharing things with each other. We're like, oh, you live above us. Oh, I've seen you before. And that was the only time. And wow. then when the lights went back on, no one said, so it's, it's not a very neighborhoody, neighborly uh, city. Um, outskirt, like other areas, yes, but not Manhattan. Um, so it's very easy to feel lonely. And I worked in the fashion industry, so it's very competitively driven. Um, and I think I was like in a not so great place in my relationship as um, someone who was in their mid twenties trying to figure out where they fit in in this life. So out of the desire of wanting to um, fill this void, um, this extension was like a healthy extension. It was self-driven. And then there are also a lot of parallels about um, wanting to accomplish a lot of things because I felt a little held back because I wasn't really fully diving deeply into my the pursuit of my, my passion and my purpose. So I think in tandem, as I was discovering physically, like how to um, overcome these distances that were very new to me, it also helped me uh, connect with community and also helped me um, accomplish a few things in my life. Mm -hmm. You basically went out and built your own community, <laughs> you know, I did. And I, and that's how it happens. Some people in some places, it's sort of inherited. Uh, what I learned when I was in Chicago, Chicago is a community. It's a big city made up of small cities inside. So like a bunch of, a bunch of people from these small towns, small Midwestern towns go to the big city <laughs> and uh, right after college and probably with their high school college sweetheart. Um, and it's already an inherited sort of, it's sort of community because they it's connected through college and it's connected mm -hmm. through sororities and fraternities. So you just slip right in. You don't really have to put forth much effort, but then there are certain environments where you do have to put forth effort. So I know what it's like to feel like that. And when I started running, when I made the effort after that 5k cross country race to go on a meetup.com show up, you know, that's all you have to do. There's always a point where it's like, ah, is it going to be worth it? You know, you, you're at a butterfly effect or a crossroads. Like, do you want to continue down the path of sameness of just, even yeah. though this is not fulfilling, but um, at the risk of going out and, you know, um, maybe embarrassing myself or being the slow, just all these, these doubts, uh, thoughts of doubt preventing you from wanting to change. Um, you're at that crossroads. And I do remember, I was like, ah, I'll check it out. And then I did, <laughs> you know, and it's the same thing with the 5k. It's like the strangers inviting you to this race that you have to go to the Bronx for. Yeah. Do you go, you don't know anything about it. You're really going on a whim. Um, but there are these moments of, of, um, there are these moments in life that, you know, we all have free will, but I do think that we have these opportunities that are kind of given to you. Mm -hmm. And then you mm -hmm. have the choice. Do you want to say the same or do you want to step out? Exactly. Courage. Courage. It takes yeah. courage. And I think people think it takes like mountains of courage, you know, like you have to be a lion, you know, roaring at the top. Otherwise it's not courage. And there's just these small 
incremental steps of courage along the path that are minor choices that lead to actions and then lead to change, right? Yeah. Like you mm -hmm. can just start so simply. Um, you showed up to one thing and then literally it changed your life. And I can say there's many of decisions I've made that the same, the same thing. It's changed the path of my life. Some of these decisions, right? Yeah. They're that powerful. Mm -hmm. So here you are, New York city, you got your jam on, you're getting your run on, you're definitely exploring yourself. What part of that journey to understand running was about you understanding your body, your physical body and how you felt about the body that you were given and the one that you're developing as a human? That's a great question. Mm. Um, so I, I don't know if this is going to accurately answer your question, but what comes to mind immediately um, so at the time when I was thinking about signing up for my first marathon, I was in my mid to late 20s. I was like 26, 27. And I remember reading that women, when they are in their mid to late 30s, they are, they are actually getting better. Like they start to peak actually at that time for endurance races. And I thought that was really appealing because we are always taught, or it's assumed from a male's perspective with speed that um, you're better, younger, faster. You're faster, younger, and at that time. So in my mind, I'm like, well, if I start now, then in the next 10 years, I could be at this really amazing place. And I never thought I was a great runner. Like in college, I would, or I'm sorry, in high school, when I ran track, I was pretty, I was like, it was fair. I mean, I wasn't like at the, the last place. I wasn't, <laughs> I, I won some of my heats for sure. Some of my races, but I wasn't like, I wasn't like seeking uh, like a scholarship or going to college for, for running, but I was swift. Um, so it wasn't until a certain time when I started to understand my ability in pursuit of running. And it all kind of connected with my, like a pursuit of wanting to run uh, this like long distances, but then connecting it with my body mm. um, and being good at it and, and knowing how to listen to your body. Um, Cause a lot of things happen, especially within the first year or two, as you're running long distances, um, your body is getting accustomed to, <laughs> I mean, you know, things have been atrophied or they just hadn't been, they just developed. don't work. They're, they were underdeveloped for long distances. So yeah. my Achilles uh, was really activated. My fascia, my plantar fascia uh, was agitated. My, oh my goodness. I didn't even know if I was going to complete my first race because I have plantar fasciitis in one oh. foot and then Achilles tendonitis in the other. And I oh, could only run 10 miles at that one time. Yeah. But then I also learned about um, psychosomatic, things being psychosomatic, you kind of internalizing and creating through doubt and fear, because this was a new experience. I honestly had no idea what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, having only run the most, like maybe uh, 20 miles in my training runs, what would happen if I continue to run six, like six more? What, what does that look like? My mm -hmm. body is freaking out. So... <laughs> So with a lot of the internal stress of just the unknown, um, as I'm physically developing and, be, and transforming into a stronger, faster runner, um, there there was a lot of there's a lot of unknown which created doubt, which created the psychosomatic um, injuries, and because I never felt those injuries while I was racing, and at the end of the the run, at the end of my first marathon. I realized I was manifesting that those injuries in my mind. Mm -hmm. So Isn't that fascinating to even think about, right? So a lot of people have this preconceived idea that they're obviously the most fit, the most strong, the most capable when they're young. Mm -hmm. Men and women have that in their headspace. You know, humans have that in their headspace that that's a thing. And what you're saying and what you and I are proof of, by the way, is that is not the case <laughs> at all. And we know thousands of people that that's not the case. So you worked through that. You took that to task. I wanted to really challenge myself to see if that was true. And I felt that it was true. Um, I also think that women are easily dismissed because we're supposed to resign our bodies to um, being anything greater 
than what it could be like in the 20s because most typically most people are supposed to get pregnant and married and pregnant or whatever that course of action in their 20s and then it's as though they their bodies are only meant for that and then nothing else right so I think there's there's this dismissiveness towards women and their bodies and I remember there was a woman who as I'm turning 40 I think or I'll be 40 this year that um what was her name? I think her name was Dana. I can't remember her last name, but she was an Olympic swimmer. Um, maybe Nyad, couple... Diana Nyad. Diana, yes. She right. is amazing. Exactly. Yeah. And so she and her like she was 40, 40 or 42. 40, she was on yeah. right. And that was such a huge deal. Huge deal. Like that was like a phenomenon. Olympic swimmer. Yeah. And oh, I am really shocked. <laughs> right. And I'm I'm just like, well, I mean, I don't know, like if if the science is saying this for runners, women who run, then shouldn't it then also translate to any other endurance sport? So why are we surprised by this? And, you know, this shouldn't be a spectacle like she's um, an anomaly or anything. I do think that a lot of, um, uh, as you're saying, like there's a ceiling that we allow ourselves. And so mentally, if we are told that we are no good up until a certain point, then people stop trying. Um, yes. But then if you don't apply the ceiling, then, you know, the sky is your limit. You can do what you want with your body when you can yeah. and push the limit. Um, yeah. And we don't have to resign ourselves to thinking that we're only good up until a certain age. You know, things definitely choose, do change as you get older. But if you continue to maintain, then women like Diana uh, are, you know, there are the norm. Yes. The norm. Yes. So some of that is um, external forces and um, concepts from the medical world, um, society, culture, etc. Right. About mm -hmm. women's roles, women's bodies. Mm -hmm. um, I know for me, I've had some health crises over my time, and that's basically how I found endurance sports and the lifestyle I have now. And many times um, traditional Western medicine and things that I was trying to work through were telling me how it should be and trying to, to uh, you know, cast my life story for me. Um, and I think that's very common. And then um, culturally, you know, there's a lot of nuances to that in our families and in our cultures. And the great thing is we're alive in this moment where these are being broken down every day. I'm so stoked at 52 to be able to be present in this moment when this is happening, you know, and for us to be on this journey together as women in the space, just working it out and working through it. Mm -hmm. So the, the message can come externally. It can also come internally. Like what you said, you have this preconceived ceiling you set for yourself. So maybe initially somebody imposed that on you, but you owned it and took it on and then made it your ceiling. Mm -hmm. And so you ultimately have the control. You took the control to say, there isn't a ceiling for me. The limits that will be in my life will be ones that I determine and I set for myself. And I will only know when I reach them. So I'll let you know when I get there, which is hopefully never. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Otherwise if they don't exist. I mean, it is, it is all about perspective and perception, yeah. perception. Um, I like the concept that life is but a dream. And if we're in this dream, then we can create and reimagine what we want our realities to look like. Mm, and I think that, um, you know, it is a little, it can be challenging if you don't really have an example, but be inspired by your own potential. Um, and, you know, you can constantly rewrite what it is meant to be, you know, whatever that is, X. Mm -hmm. Totally. And there are so many examples. So I think nowadays everybody has examples. If they don't see them in their immediate circle, friend and family community circle, you just need to look a little bit harder outside of that because yeah. it could be you read Diana and I's book, which I did, and it's phenomenal. Everybody should read it. Or um, Rebecca Rush, I read her book. I was in my 40s at the time. She's a professional mountain biker and just an icon in the adventure uh, space. And she didn't even start professionally racing mountain bike till she was 40. And I had, I just turned 40 or was early 40s. And I was like, mountain biking, that's a thing. <laughs> I literally went out and bought a mountain bike within like it. a month of finishing that book. 
because I was like, wait a minute. Like though, so those opportunities exist from complete strangers out in the space who are here to inspire. Um, if you so choose or go looking, I watch a lot of documentaries. I read a lot of books, you know, you're probably into that kind of stuff too. So there's so much nourishment mm -hmm. and so much fuel out there. If you are willing to let your spark begin, you know, and then you have to keep throwing logs on the fire lady. <laughs> yes. Yes. So I, I also like to think of things in this perspective that we are older, longer than we're younger. Ooh. Um, and so do as much as you can while you can. Um, because, you know, we, we keep, you know, through uh, the media and magazines and, you know, it, it is a constant reminder of what this fountain of youth that we are trying to reach for, right? And that our time of our lives should have been or are and are supposed to be in our 20s. Um, but a lot of people are fixed on like what who they used to be and not in the present moment. Mm -hmm. And we keep applying the sense of being old when you aren't. Um, <laughs> Yeah. And so when, you know, like say perspective is everything. So when you're in your sixties, you wish you were in your forties, but to a 30 year old or a 20 year old, 40 seems old, but to a 60 year old, 40 seems young. <laughs> and the same thing with like 80, 80 to 60, 80 seems old to many, um, but, or 60 seems old to many, but to an 80 year old, it's, they're still pretty young. So it's all about perspective. And I do think that we're older, longer than we are younger, but while we can, when we have our bodies to do these amazing things to mount bike while you're 40, why not? Like who says that we can't, you know, I want to learn how to skateboard. You don't really see many people who <laughs> learn how to skateboard when they are like in their late thirties, early forties, but like, why not? You know, so mm -hmm. you have to explore these things while, while we can. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it's never too early and it's never too late either. Um, you know, it's both sides of that spectrum. Like there shouldn't be limits on any, any of those numbers because age is just a number, mm -hmm. right? What does it really have to do with who we are as human beings? Nothing whatsoever. No. You know, it's, it's bizarre that we get so attached to it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you started your running career, you went down the path, you ran your first marathon and then in New York City, and then you moved to Chicago. Um, how old were you when you moved to Chicago? Um, like mapping was it right for now. A was it for a job or what was your intention? No, so I, I moved to Chicago for a, like love. My boyfriend um, moved it. out there from okay. Brooklyn. And uh, so it was interesting because 2010, I ran my first marathon. And then in those four years from like those four years, I ran seven. Um, Chicago, Chicago kind of broke me. It, there's a lot of things that play into that, right? So my um, sense of community and what, what running is about was so solely structured and really rooted in New York City and during those four years. Okay. And uh, we, I ran somewhat competitively and I realized I was pretty good at running competitively. So I had this amazing group of people to bounce off of and the support. Mm -hmm. Then when I left that community to move to Chicago, like enduring those, no matter who you are, like to endure the, the winter that I went through. I mean, that was incredibly challenging, but like I've, I've run through really terrible winters in Chicago, in New York city before, but when you do it with people, it just makes everything better. Yeah. And I've run, I've trained for most marathon or for a season of a marathon by myself before. And it wasn't, it wasn't terrible, but to do it in Chicago was like the worst thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was, I was training for 2014 Boston Marathon. And, uh, and then that was, it was an amazing experience, but that was my last marathon. Mm -hmm. And I haven't really picked one up again um, for many reasons. It's like life at first, like I uh, left around the time I wanted to explore running another marathon. I left Chicago. I didn't really know where my life or where I was going to spend uh, moved to after that. Um, and then I moved to San Diego because San Diego made me happy, but I also thought I- Because it's would... sunny and warm in San Diego. It's, uh, <laughs> it's the opposite of, of Chicago. Right. Um, 
but I, I really thought that like my, my running would like blossom and I would thrive, but it's still, it's like, I didn't have the same community to be like, we're running this team points race, right? Like we're doing this 18 mile together, right? Like you just had that. It's so hard to really like tap into that or to find that kind of community. And I realized I was searching for that same community that I found in New York mm. in other areas. Yeah. Because I really bounced off because I, yeah, I, I really bounced off or uh, bounced off of their energies and their enthusiasm for want, wanting to run when just do the best of what you can. And then I moved to San Diego. And what was interesting was that like, while I realized that my relationship with running was changing, I also realized that there was an opportunity within San Diego that I noticed um, for San Diego to like, you know, the triathlon was born Big, here. Yeah. And um, for what San Diego is, it seemed very disconnected in terms of community. Mm -hmm. um, it's not the largest city, you know? I mean, I feel like by scale, it's definitely larger than um, New York City, but New York City is a big city feel. So it's easy to get lost, but I just always knew what was going on there. Here, I never really knew what was going on. Um, if there was a race that was happening that I might've wanted to register for, I never knew that was happening until after it occurred and I saw it on Instagram. And that frustrated me. It's like, how would I have known about these races if, Big, you know, and then the old, old school way of going about this is, um, you know, you go to your local running store and there's a community board with flyers and it's a very static way of communicating. It doesn't leave that section of the store. So there's no real promotion of that event. Commuter, uh, com competitor magazine doesn't really exist anymore. So that's not an easy way for me to, um, to find these races and, um, and yeah, so it was, it was a bit of a loss for me to not just find races, but also to find other running communities in San Diego. So for me, like to me, for me to redevelop a relationship with running, um, things changed for me when I moved to San Diego and I realized that I could probably uh, change how people, um, find each other yeah, through yeah. running. Well, so you decided Again, by the way, you didn't give up running. You're not like, no. okay, well, so I should just stop running and take up, you know, basket weaving or some other shenanigans here. No. <laughs> Which happens in a lot of life changes, transitions around relationships, uh, moving, all of the things, right? New jobs, et cetera, et cetera, babies, whatever, all this life stuff, right? People mm -hmm. will give up something that they love quite readily when there's a big life change. Mm -hmm. So you instead decided to dig your heels in and double down and create your own community. I did. <laughs> uh, yeah. Tell me so, about it. so it, it kind of, uh, you know, it, it's, it started in just one exploring, like what is what maybe I'm missing something, you know, and I would talk to one of the guys who puts on races in San Diego and asked him, you know, we were commiserating, or commiserating, but then also realizing there is an opportunity. And we would also look back into what would happen on the East Coast, like East Coast in Boston and New York and how that culture was just how that's so successful and so popular. Why isn't that here in San Diego? Um, through, through, so I would lead and co-lead some run clubs in San Diego. On a Thursday night, I led, um, a beer run club, so super social, not competitive at all. But on that Thursday night, I realized that a lot of people who were not big into the running community, who didn't know of other running clubs came to this particular run club that would also ask me if I knew of any other run clubs. So I was like, oh, so there's a miss here. Let me figure out how I can connect this missing link. I was already trying to create a run. Um, I was already trying to create an app um, a running app called Pace Partner for another business that I was working on, um, which was a, a run club. Uh, I'm sorry, um, running tour called Step by Step Run, where we provide guided runs for people who visit San Diego. So I was developing um, an app for people who travel or, and around running. For this particular app, or for this particular opportunity, late at night, I was trying to figure out how am I going to connect the running community through social media? How am I going to give people the rundown of what's going on in San Diego? <gasps> it's the rundown. The rundown. 
So oh, I yeah. cre- that was my <laughs> light bulb moment, my aha moment at 1.30 in the morning that I am going to create this community app called The Rundown where people can get all things running related in San Diego. And so uh, February of 2020 is when I launched. January of 2020 is when I had the idea. So within a month and a half, I was able to develop the app. It's a web-based app, it's no code. So I didn't have to like take a boot camp to figure this out. Um, and that's when I, I, I wanted to cultivate a community that already is, but have it all in one place, like a connectivity hub mm-hmm. so that people know what is out there within reach. Um, and as a result, it, which makes me so happy because it, we launched it right before the pandemic and we were telling people to get together and then three weeks later, we're like, don't get together, you know, but still keep running, but don't get together. Mm-hmm. And then uh, at the end of the year, you know, we were able to get together again safely. Um, and in the absence of a lot of these run clubs that existed before the pandemic, they, they stopped. Um, came up with this new generation, these, this new class of runners, runners or people who wanted to create community um, because nothing was happening. A lot of these run clubs um, were either attached to a running store. And so these running stores didn't want the liability of yeah. what if someone caught uh, COVID during one of their events, um, or it was like maybe an old run club. So a lot of these people just, just was like, they showed up and they're like, I'm gonna just, we, for mental, for a mental state of mind, we need um, running back in our lives and, commu- and combine that with community because um, we are locked in and we're in a state of isolation and it's playing on a lot of people's mental health. So um, as a result, a lot of new run clubs have, have, have popped up during the pandemic, which is really beautiful. And, um, and then now there are these collaborations of run clubs that is like what I, I guess I had imagined before, like why don't, why isn't there this connectivity, you know, across um, certain parts of the city? And now it's happening because um, now that uh, maybe one run club leader will then on their off day would go to a run club, visit them, make hmm. friends, and then they would have these collaboration runs together. And it's just, it really is tying the community together in a way that didn't exist since I've been here. Um, And it's really, it's really wonderful how it's evolving. And this pandemic has also created a new group of runners because uh, gyms had closed and um, they couldn't really do anything else but run. Um, So people were discovering running in a new way. So now we have a whole new group, a whole new population of new runners that are out there that's looking for other people who are like them. I have a couple questions about that. First of all, congratulations for making your dream reality. Thank so you. So cool. So cool. Thank you. And that's how we met. So I'm super graced by that. And then I want to see your thoughts on this. So um, I have lived in a lot of different places and I've belonged to a lot of running clubs. I was a triathlete, triathlon clubs, all the things, cycling clubs. Um, I actually also have been a coach. So I had my own triathlon club and running club. So I've done a lot of those things. And we're both Lululemon ambassadors. So we do (laughs) run club activity with Lululemon. So, you know, we definitely have been playing in the space a lot and seeing a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I do think it's super interesting that during this pandemic moment, while people are isolated and taken out of their everyday routines of whatever that looked like for them in the health and fitness body movement space, why do you feel now people would be more open to cross-pollinating running clubs or cycling clubs and triathlon clubs? Why, why in general would people want to come together now? Whereas before they stayed in their little silos in their own little spaces and did not connect with one another. Why is that? I think like the sense of community was just even more pronounced now and the greater sense of community and not just within your bubble. Um, there are so many, so with, with um, the help of social media, you know, being able to have a window as to what other run clubs are doing and being able to identify like, hey, that's a, a cool group also. And I don't have to 
only stay loyal to one group. I can also mm-hmm. expand that loyalty across. Yes. I can get in my car and um, <laughs> check out this other area. And what's odd, actually what? odd for me is like uh, having lived in New York for so long, to get in a car to go run was very unusual for me. It's now just such a norm because there's so many great places in San Diego that like it would, it, you would have to get in a car. But um but like get in the car, go check out this run. It's not that far. For places like LA, um, the communities there are really interesting in LA. Like LA is not like that big of a city from Santa Monica to downtown LA. It's like maybe eight miles, but it could take 40 minutes to an hour, hour and a half just to get across town sometimes. So people don't really wanna go check out that run club that's on the east side if you're coming from Santa Monica. Um, so they stay within their bubble about what happened when fewer people were on the road. Um, during the pandemic, more people were able to get out of the bubble. Ch- mm-hmm. And uh, through one of my challenges through the app um, I, called Rediscover LA, it prompted people to really get out of their, their neighborhood to check out some of those gyms. And then within those gyms, there are these run clubs that people can experience. So um, I think that there's just a few things where we, our loyalty can, can be expanded. And loyalty doesn't just have to be with, within our own run club. It could be for runners, or runners, runners across the board. Um, there've been a lot of, there've been a lot of um, movements through run that I think has, have also prompted people to really get together, you know, like running for Brianna Taylor, running for mm-hmm. um, Ahmad Aubrey. I think that also has um, elevated people to see running, not just as a mode of fitness, but as a mode of like protest. Yeah. Um, so yes. I think in this past year, um, you know, there, that's just, that's a way that people choose to express um, their, their rights, you know, um so it's it's I think there's it's it's a complex way or reason as to why but you realize that like within each running club there are cultures and um each culture may not tap into all of the things that make who make up who you are but yes. then you're like oh that's a that's a really cool run club that drinks beer and then this one really um is an <laughs> advocacy run club and then this one is just like you know so you really are able to uh experience all the many dynamic forms of run clubs that are also live within you what came up for me while you were talking about that was the word identity and how people identify themselves with their community who they hang out with, you know, the things that they do, their job, their structure, their routine, et cetera, et cetera. And then during the pandemic, a lot of that came crashing down. Mm -hmm. So either, you know, we smashed it ourselves because it was broken and it needed to be smashed or the world smashed some of it for us. And it was also shocking. And so I think what was so cool in all of those moments of brokenness it allowed people to really look at their own value system and how they identify and challenge that and so then what you're seeing and saying through running people also challenge their their running identities to maybe explore something new and different and find people who the values aligned or something that was happening there in a movement resonated with them or just the opportunity for them to think differently beyond their everyday grind Mm -hmm. about what was possible, right? So when you think about what's possible for your own life, you have to also think about who is possible and the relationships that you could form in order to continue to grow as a human. And then running being that tool of learning, of connection, of transformation and of growth. So you're currently making that your life's work, the rundown. Mm -hmm. I wanna really understand your vision for that and where it's headed. Mm -hmm. Um, I call it like a thesis in a way because it helps me um, understand how I navigate this process, not to take on, not to, it may not be my intention take on everything, but if it aligns with my thesis, which is 
you know, I want to make running accessible to everybody and that running is for everybody. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's the accessibility to be able to go find community. Um, and to your point, uh, a lot of that surrounding identity and is finding spaces uh, that are inclusive of who you are. Mm -hmm. um, also having run leaders understand that too. This isn't yeah. just um, an application that is just, just taking anything and all. Um, there's a lot of intention around this. This is, um, you know, wanting to get to know and understand who some of these run leaders are and their run clubs and their missions and um, making sure that they are in alignment with who we are because we also want to promote, amplify these run clubs so that these runners can trust us and through us, they can trust the run clubs that they can show up in these spaces. Um, so it is very important for me, kind of like what I was saying before, I understand what it's like to be without in the absence of a community in my life. Um, you know, I think like there was a moment in my life in my twenties that were a little dark where it was self isolation. And I just don't ever want anyone to feel like they don't belong. Mm -hmm. um, and through this medium of running, I think running, you know, running allows you to sort through so many things. I mean, running is therapy. We hear that as a bit of a cliche, but um, running helped me in those parallel, achieve those achievements mentally, also physically. And they were really great parallels for me to really get out, out of myself, you know, and not having to think about like, um, well, who am I if I am not doing this kind of job and bringing in this kind of money? You know, I'm Iman. I'm Iman who, I am a person who um, can set a goal and can train for these goals and I can do hard things and I can come out and I can be better than what I expected to be at the end of it. You know, I am that. And I think as adults, we get trapped in, in identifying who we are based off of what we make and what other people tell us. Mm -hmm. You are an assistant, you are this. And so we think that if we're this, then we are less than anybody else. But what I love about running is that by making running accessible, it, it, there's equity in that, it levels the playing field. We sweat together, we endure together. We talk about the what we accomplish. We high five, we sweaty high five, we hug it out. We um, accomplish things together. And I think that's what's really beautiful about running and pursuing those hard things together um, that we don't often do in our nine to five or whatever that, that is. So I guess if I were to boil it down, I, I wanna make, the rundown is a place where, you know, you, you can be not seen. I mean, yes, you can be seen, but it, you can hold space. You can hold space for others and you can expect to show up and be yeah. yourself. Yes, yes. More of that, more of that, more of yes. that. <laughs> this has been so great. So great. I have a final question for you as we start to wrap up our time together today. What does endurance mean to you? Endurance is to, to withstand, to um, measure out your energy accordingly mm -hmm. so that you can um, do the thing. Mm -hmm. You know, like how you measure out your energy and not just throw it all in one place or th throw it around just however way but it's almost a little bit, it's measured, it's thoughtful, it's mindful. You're really thinking about the journey and each milestone along the journey. Um, Cause there's no real goal in this, you know, there's, there's movement, but um, as long as you continue to keep moving bodies in motion, stay in motion. And uh, it's knowing how to sustain that energy for as long as your body can stay present with where we are here. I love it. And I love how you said, do the thing, because it's not 
just about running. It's yeah. all the things. It's called uh, living. Yes. <laughs> it's called living yes. in life. Yes. Okay, my beautiful friend, how can people find you, follow you, and find more about the rundown? Mm -hmm. um, so you can find, um, if you want to download the rundown, it's a web-based app. We are not on the App Store yet. Um, you can go to therundown.run. Um, follow us on Instagram at therundown.run. Um, and I am also on Instagram as animanapia. It was nice to meet you or see yeah, you. Yeah, see your beautiful face. And uh, we will be together. Yes, we're going to we work on some adventures together, you and I. And I'm oh, so yes. stoked for like a next level collaboration. It's going to be so good. It's going to be so good. Okay, okay, fantastic. And you enjoy the rest of your day. Are you going to get in a run today or did you get in a run today? No, I, I will. I have a, the option of running on the track or going to a group run. So I'm trying to weigh it out in my mind right now. Do I want it to hurt really bad or, <laughs> <laughs> or do I want it to hurt a little bit? Oh, that's so awesome. Awesome. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Well, however you slice it, just make it yours. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you have for having me. You're welcome. Take care, darling. Bye. Bye.